So uh, she's worked for companies uh, such as Voltage Security, Visa, and CyberSource. She's always subscribed to a hands-on approach that supports business and re re resellers by helping them understand payments and payment security from the ground up and which pitfalls to avoid. So let's welcome Lisa. So I'm going to talk about payment. Um, there's something I don't address um, in my presentation. We have a, a sponsored booth call page out on the side, so if I, I can probably help you with most of your payment questions, or if I don't know the answer, I probably know how to, how to figure it out. Um, so payments have changed a lot recently. Um, my first experience with payments was um, working, watching my parents run their own business. So my parents owned a small machine shop in Fremont, California, kind of on the East Bay. Um, I would watch my father finish a job, and then my mother would fill out the purchase order, and there was like three copies. We would get in the car, and she, we would go down 237, which it had a carpool lane, and so she would always ask me to come with her, and so that we could uh, <laughs> get there faster. She would deliver it, she would tear one of the sheets out, and then she would come back and she would enter it into a ledger, like in pen. She would totally enter it in pen, and I'm like, I would never do that, but she would enter it in pen. So, um, you know, just a quick aside, at my parents' business, they, um, as a child, a lot of my punishments and rewards were doled out in, you know, going to the shop to help out. And we made these, uh, we would call them rails, because they looked like they were railroad tracks. And as an after school, you'd have to go in and you'd have a drill press where you would thread three holes on these rails. And we would do thousands of them. So things that I wanted to do as a child, like if you wanted a pair of roller blades that was like always framed in how many rails it would take for the machine shop to sell for us to afford the roller blades or you know, whatever it was. So many years later, I um, found a job at Mountain View and we had a company meeting at the Computer History Museum. So I saw this machine and I realized that the rails that we were making were actually the guide rails to slide the car into rail. So that's what I spent the majority of my time after school doing and at my parents' business. So, um, so technology has, has changed. It's my parents and your parents, everybody's friends run their business. Uh, there's a lot of new sales channels. You know, I've been hearing some people are starting a business and all they do is sell on Instagram. Like, they just take pictures of their products and that's how they sell. Um, there's also um, new sales channels for the same product. So, I don't know if any of you have seen those Casper mattresses. Like, is there any good? Like, should I get one? <laughs> are they good? Um, but they started a website where they're selling directly to the consumer. And then I saw that they're actually selling in through Target. Uh, Target stores now. So they have two channels. So they're selling direct to consumer, which is one kind of transaction, and then they're also selling B2B, but it's, it's the same product. Um, customers, you find them now through Google AdWords. You, know, you don't just put in a ad in the yellow pages or hang up your shingle out front of your business. Um, new payment methods, there's been um, a lot of the technology on the back end is still the same. You know, it's still Visa Net, Visa's Rails, but you've got your Visa card in an Apple wallet. Um, so there's a lot of new payment methods. And all. There's also changes in security. With processing payments and credit cards, there's a security standard that everyone that's processing payments needs to adhere to. It's called the PCI, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, um, which you used to not have to worry about. I mean, your big worry was maybe if you took the bag of cash from the business to the bank to deposit it that nobody was going to rob you, but now you've got to you know, lock all the doors and windows for your e-commerce site, your website, your CRM. Also, um, this API ecosystem. So um, now there's digital downloads and drop shipping and all kinds of automation. And the other day, um, I was looking for some cycling jerseys to wear with my cycling. We wanted to, we run, we have an all-girl cycling team, and so we wanted uh, jerseys with our nicknames on it. We thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll order these. So I placed an order, and then I was wondering, you know, how big is the pocket in the back? Is it going to fit my sandwich or whatever I want when I'm on my bike? So I rang up the company, found out that they were in the UK, and I asked them this question, and they said, well, um, you know, we actually 
manufacture in China and then be drop shipped. So like, I don't have a jersey in front of me to measure. And I thought that just blows my mind that everything's connected, you know, through APIs and software. And here's a vendor in the UK selling to me in the US and, you know, they don't even have the physical product in front of them. Um, so before Web 2.0, and I'm kind of using this Web 2.0 to, to differentiate like when there started to be user-generated content, like when there started to be WordPress. Before that, you know, it took deep pockets to set up your website. You had to really build everything from scratch. There wasn't form builders and drag and drop. Now it's pretty much, you know, anybody can, can put a website together. Um, and customers are really shifting um, to um, want to buy from small retailers. Like there was a big disruption in razors, you know, Gillette, you make your money on the blades, not the razor. And here comes the Dollar Shave Club, you know, from nowhere with just a website. And um, they really um, were able to, you know, take a hit into the big Gillette manufacturing business. Um, there's also like this concept of um, omni-channel when I'm talking about, you know, you might interact with a merchant through their website, but then you may want to return it in the store. So when you're talking about payments, you know, how can you not make that just a complete nightmare for your customer? You know, how can you refund them? You know, maybe they want to get the money back on the same card that they paid with, but you don't have it in your retail system. How can you provide this kind of cohesive um, experience for your customer? Um, but with new platforms like WordPress, um, we've kind of leveled the, the playing field of this evolution of commerce into kind of a single lens of the customer, no matter how they, they want to interact with you. Um, also, the, the subscription model is just kind of, there's a, there's a subscription box for everything, and everything is shifting to the subscription model. I heard uh, someone was telling me that the car company Peugeot is actually starting a so car subscription service. So it's not a lease, it's not a buy, it's you actually subscribe to get, you know, you make a monthly payment, you get to drive the car, and then do you want it next month, yes or no, or do you want a different one? So things are just really shifting more towards uh, recurring subscription type businesses. Also, uh, WooCommerce, I was looking on the um, WordPress site, and I think it has like four million downloads, and it's just a ton of volume. So things are, <clears throat> things are growing. Um, so um, really merchants of any size can use the website builder to um, create their own uh, website. Um, open source nature of, and all of the plugins, everything that you can just put together on um, WooCommerce, it provides a little merchant, you know, a starting place, a place to get their foothold. Um, so you're thinking about your website, you're thinking about your domain, you're thinking, what am I going to sell? Am I going to sell on Instagram? You have all these questions, you know, I've seen a lot of people come by the booth, there are a lot of designers, you know, what is the site going to look like? And payments is kind of something you don't really think about at the start, but it's really like the whole point, you know? Like, how are you going to get paid? How is that money from your customer going to get into your bank account? Um, so payments are typically just, you know, they're not, it's a, it's not something that's fun, it's something that a lot of fees and things are associated with and it's complicated and it's actually, it's a little bit fragmented, right? You know, when you think about setting up, um, you know, your website, is it going to work with this payment gateway? Is it going to work with my merchant account that I already have? And it's just, it's really confusing. So um, I wanted to just talk through a case study. Somebody came by um, earlier and was talking to me about a um, client she was supporting that does a quilting business. So you take this quilting business, this person might have opened up a store in their neighborhood. Uh, they probably walked down to you know Bank of America and said, I'm gonna, can you open up a business account for me? And they said, you need a machine to swipe cards. So she's got her machine from Bank of America, she's swiping cards and she's got her store. Then thinking, okay, I want to sell, you know, beyond my um, beyond my local neighborhood. I'm going to build a site. I'm going to set it up for WooCommerce. I'm going to build my website. Now, can she get her sales from her website into the same account as 
her store. You know, maybe, maybe not. There are some things at the end of the presentation I want to talk to you about that might help streamline some of these things. The next she decides, you know, it might be great to put some ads on Pinterest, put something on Instagram and try and capture some sales through there. Some of the platforms that you might use to build your website, maybe they don't have an extension or they don't have a plugin to allow you to capture a sale on a social media site. So maybe you look for a different one. You know, maybe you, you buy a Shopify because they have a, a Facebook stores connection. So then you've got kind of three things, three ways that you're selling and you're trying to get and figure out where all your money is. And you decide to go to the Maker Fair and uh, sell quilting supplies. And um, you, just, you decide to get a little, maybe a square device or something like that, just so that you can take payment right away from your customer. And then maybe you decide that you want to um, sell subscriptions. Maybe you want to do, you know, quilting of the, quilt of the month club or something like that. So you've got all of these ways that you're selling. And if you're not careful, you can have a different payment transaction flow for each one. Um, some of them, all of them will have fees associated with it. So if some of them have a, you know, say a $9.99 per month fee, you might be paying that five times, you might be paying it 10 times if you don't try and minimize things and streamline things. It's also very hard, you know, if you're trying to use, say, QuickBooks for your, um, you know, to import all of your sales into, well, what if your sales are coming from a couple of different places, you know, what, what can you do? Um, how do you know that um, you got paid for all of your sales? Like typically, um, at the end of the day, you, you batch out your transactions. It's a hundred dollars of you know quilting supplies that you sell. But then the next day, when the money gets funded into your um, bank account, it's something like eighty-seven. You know, it's, it's not exactly what what you got. There's some fees taken out, and you're trying to figure out like, did I get all the money? Was there a reject? Did anything happen? You know, and was I paid? Did my transaction turn into cash in my account? And when you start growing up into all of these different channels, it becomes really hard to tell. So I wanted to give you just some tips on um, what you can look for in a payment solution as you're going out and you're evaluating vendors, you're looking at e-commerce platforms, some of the things that you might want to be looking at depending on how you're, how you're selling. So first off, I think payment gateways are great. Payment gate gateways are sort of like glue that can sit in between um, your payment acceptance, right, where you're selling, and your, your merchant account. So if you find a payment gateway that you like, um, and you decide you don't like your merchant account provider, you can just, usually there's a drop down where you say, you know, I'm switching from this bank to this bank, and you can keep the gateway and switch out the, the end piece. And likewise, on the front end, if you're using a, um, Shopping cart, maybe you've got more than one shopping cart for you know different different reasons. You can switch out, uh, you can keep the same payment gateway and add your um, different different shopping carts on the front end. Um, also, look for level two and level three processing. So, if in the example of um, Casper, the mattress company, when they sell B two B. Um, versus B to C, the transactions will qualify. So qualification is what the transaction costs to process. Um, it costs a lot less for a B to B transaction than it does for a B to C transaction. So in order to process a transaction at level two and three, there's some additional data that needs to be passed in with the transaction. I don't know if you've ever seen a credit card statement on a, a business card where there's actually line item detail. It says, you know, SKU, how many things you bought. That's level two and three data. And the presence of that data makes the transaction process a lot cheaper. So if you're using a payment service and you're, you ended up getting presented with a business card, you absolutely want to pass that data in so that you can qualify at the lower rate versus uh, B to Z. Um, there's really no value that the, the card qualifies for what it qualifies for. So there are some payment solutions out there that don't support level two and level three. So there's no way to send it. There's no way to get that cheaper rate. You definitely want to check for that. Um, also, the, just the ability to um, synchronize with other reports and other software. So if you are, you know, everybody has to pay taxes at the end of the year and you need to tell someone how much money you made and you want to get all of that transaction, all of that sales, all of that, all of that deposit data 
into one ledger that you can then say this is how much I made. And if you've got, um, maybe your payment gateway has a, a sync into QuickBooks, it's very easy, you push a button, so you centralize all of your payment acceptance and channel through one payment gateway, so it's all, all of your data is located on the payment gateway, and then you can sync from the payment gateway into your accounting software, and it's just it's just one button that you click. So I definitely look for any any kind of uh, sync or plugin or um, tool that you can get on your payment gateway that would push sales data into your accounting platform. Sometimes there are um, you'll see download a file in Excel and import into QuickBooks. Um, I did have a small stint where I tried to run my own business and I did that and everything got entered twice and it was just like the biggest nightmare. So I thought it would be really nice if there was some intelligence around the syncing of, of my sales data into my accounting platform just to make sure that you know it didn't create a bunch of duplicate entries because I find I found that when I did the accounting for my business, you know, I at the beginning it would be off by just a little bit and I would think, well, you know, it's not that bad. I'm just gonna just gonna ride with it. And it just got worse and worse and worse over the months to where it was like, I just need to start over because nothing is matching and that, that discrepancy just keeps growing. Um, also, for your payment option, you want to look at um, security. So I mentioned earlier that PCI DSS for payment card industry data security standard. Every year, you'll fill out a questionnaire, and at the very top, it kind of asks, a very basic question like how are you taking payments are you touching payment data and you can answer no to that first question and then you just get a couple more questions you know do you have a lock on your front door very very basic but if you answer yes to that question and say that you know I am collecting credit card data on my site it's touching my server that questionnaire can um, turn into I think it's about 256 questions very detailed it would take you a lot of time to fill out so when you're looking at a payment solution you want to ask you know do you have a hosted option do you have something that can remove all of the payment data from my website from my hosting provider so I can just say no to that first question and kind of skate by as far as PCI I mean some of the larger um, clients that I've dealt with that, are, that maybe they don't have a choice to accept credit card data on their system, they finish an audit and then they start planning for the next one immediately. They try and stop. So it can be a huge pain and it's just great if you say you've got a hosted checkout page, you've got a drop-in frame. Um, the drop-in frame would be viewed by, your, by the card holder on their site. They would enter the card data from the website, it would post directly to the payment processor site. A token would get passed back, and that can be passed through the payment gateway. And so no, there's no payment data ever on the hosting site. You're just easy peasy. Oops. Also, um, Card vault and tokenization. So one of the kind of buzzwords around um, card vault and tokenization, when you're talking to any payment provider, you want to ask about data pool, you want to leave that payment gateway, and they, you, you've got tokens for all of your cardholder data. So what that, it's sort of like poker, right? You, you go into the casino, you give them a dollar, you get a token back, or you get a, a poker chip back, and then you can use that, again, at that cashier's office to get cash but you're not actually walking around the casino with cash or, or a credit card number. So sometimes what happens is um, merchants get sort of held hostage by their payment provider in that um, they said, tokenize all my cards. Uh, so they, they just have the poker chips on their system and they, maybe they've got a recurring billing so that you know everything's working great. You send the token into the payment provider, they look up the card number, they send it on for processing. Well, if something goes sour with that relationship or maybe a system compatibility issue where you decide that you need to leave the company that's giving you the token provider, sometimes they'll say like, oh, sorry, <laughs> we've got all your data, but you know, good luck to you. And that would be a huge pain for you, you know, if, you're, if you have subscriptions, right? If you're billing monthly, like how would you even, basically you'd have to start over and get all of the card data contact your customers and say, we need to keep your subscription up to date. And frankly, you just, you probably would deal with whatever problem 
you know, you're trying to solve on your with your with your payment system before you went through all of that hassle. So that's a I hear that a lot from clients that they they've been held hostage and they can't get their data out, they can't move around. So typically, um, if you're looking at a vendor's um, spec sheet, you're you know, trying to evaluate to say do you have data portability. You might sometimes they do. Um, since they, it is sensitive data that they're giving back to you, sometimes they will make you go through a couple of hoops. Like they might say, you know, I'm not gonna. I want to make sure I'm giving it to to a secure person. So maybe they'll put it on a physical media, password protected, or maybe they'll insist on SFTPing it to you, which is fine. That's great. At least you've got your data and you can import it somewhere else, and you've avoided having them, you know, just hold you hostage to their service and paying their fees. Um, also, just reporting and storage capabilities. So, it's really nice if you can track a, a single transaction all the way to a deposit on your on your deposit account. So, when you're looking, typically, of what a, what a merchant does is they go into their Wells Fargo account and they're looking for did I did I get all of my money right? Something's wrong, and you want to know you know where did it go wrong? It would be you really want to be able to take your deposit to your daily batches to your transaction and figure out where exactly you went wrong. So sometimes what can happen is you, know, you submit the transaction, everything looks great, and maybe there's a back end reject, right? You didn't get paid for your transaction, and and if you don't have some kind of unique identifier, you know which issue or was it? Who do I call? Because sometimes what happens when you've got um, you know a Shopify or a, a WordPress website sending to a payment gateway and then sending to a merchant account bank and I went through a couple of the reviews there too. Sometimes some of that unique identifying data, sometimes it falls off. Sometimes what you do have to do is match two numbers together to find to find the, the transaction, which you can do, but it's really nice if you can say, I'm gonna put a purchase ID or an order number on my order, right? Send it through, invoice number, whatever you want to do. And then you can actually follow that all the way through, and it makes it really easy if you're trying to troubleshoot. Also, if you ever have to call up anybody on the, um, you know, the transaction flow, you, you can know that you're talking about the same transaction. Um, but I have seen a lot of issues with folks trying to figure out, you know, what happened to this specific transaction. And there's, you know, there's no identifier. And typically, and also I've seen a lot of times with the, um, you know, subscription model. Like, you're, you bill everybody $9.95 per month, so it's like it's very, if you're trying to find the amount, it's, it's very hard, and especially when you add tokenization, in, you know, you don't have a you don't have a card number to identify the transaction because you've used tokenization, and the tokenization typically, you know, it the the card has to get detokenized before it's sent on to you know the issuer to get an authorization because they don't accept a token at the issuing side. So if you want to talk to the issuer, you need some, some way to identify that transaction. Also, um, the ability to generate customized reports. Um, there's a, I, if, you, if, you, if you get a report from one of your vendors and it's in a certain format, has anybody in here ever seen a credit card statement? Okay, that's <laughs> pretty, pretty long and pretty, pretty unwieldy. So you might see that your, um, Maybe your statement has been formatted a certain way, and then when you compare that to your gateway report, you want to format it in the same way so you don't have to do this like mental gymnastics to kind of figure out what, what it is you're looking at. So a lot of the uh, API-based um, payment gateways, you, know, you can uh, make a, a get request and you can apply filters and get the data back formatted in exactly the way that, that you want it. Um, you can also filter out, you know, if you've got uh, maybe two different channels coming through the same payment gateway, you might be able to, you, you can put a source on the transaction and say, just show me these transactions. Maybe you want to do a little bit of analysis, like, are my sales rising or falling on Instagram? And then you're looking at your deposit report and they're all in one big, one big lump. You really want that flexible reporting platform so that you can peel out the data that you don't want to see in that report. Um, also, the ability to create hierarchies. This is a big one. Uh, I think just recently with kind of like the grid database, I think some payment companies have been have started to um, deal with this a, a lot better than they had in the past. But um, for um, 
for just kind of like a single mid tied to a single account, um, if you opened up another website, right, and you, you might get a login to your bank account at, you know, account number one, and then you open up the second one, and for maybe for Visa rules or MasterCard rules, they say you actually need a second account. Sometimes that happens if you're selling. When we pass a transaction through, we also have we always have to classify it with um, an SIC code, an industry code. And sometimes, you know, you see yourself as one business, but you're selling two two things, and for whatever reason, Visa or MasterCard view that as two accounts. You need two SIC codes, so here you are with two accounts. So then you'll have a login to account with SIC1 and then a login with SIC2. And um, you have to remember the password and use different API keys to get you know, your transaction data out of each account. So if you look for a provider that has can support hierarchy, they can create new users at higher nodes um, so that you can view all of the data at, at one time. So if you wanted to do an export, you could say, you know, use my security key for my leaf node or use it for my, you know, my main node. Um, and that's really nice to do is also if like maybe you're dealing with um, a third party accountant and you don't want the accountant to see all of your data, you can create just 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 access for her to just maybe pull your deposit data. Maybe she comes in every day or he comes in every day and just does uh, a daily reconciliation, but you don't want him to see all of the other things that are, all of the other data that are, that's in your account. Maybe you don't want them to um, be able to refund any of your customers. You just want them to see one, one section of your data. So I think, you know, on day one when you start out, you think, you know, this is great, but then as your business grows, I think people kind of get painted into a corner by some of these things and then held, held hostage and they just kind of end up with this solution that it could be, a, reconciliation could be a lot simpler. Um, I have talked to folks who uh, kind of revamped what they were doing for reconciliation, maybe at a mid-sized company, and they said, you know what, we were having four people do, we can have one people do now that we've got the right access level and the right um, hierarchy set up in our platform. <clears throat> Sorry about this. I my the computer that I brought with me. I had just upgraded to the latest and greatest Macintosh, and it came with a little tiny USB one. And they didn't have it here, so I, I'm borrowing someone's. And I, he has a uh, very quick timeout. Um, also, this is kind of a, a very unpleasant part of processing credit cards is dealing with um, disputes or a chargeback. You might have heard of a chargeback. So that, when that happens, that is your customer calling their issuing bank to dispute a transaction. So in a perfect world, the customer would call you and say, you know, I didn't get what I ordered. We can't hear you off the oh, line. Sorry. sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so the customer would say, you know, I didn't get what I ordered. Um, if they contact you, you know, it's great. You can deal with it. You can most most of the time when I have a dispute like that, I contact the merchant and I'm shocked. I said, well, we'll just send you another one. Um, but sometimes the cardholder doesn't give you the chance to do that. They go right to their issuing bank and they issue a dispute. Um, so when you're in the event that that happens. You want to know about all your disputes. You want to be able to deal with them um, in a single portal, and you want to be able to upload all of your documentation. So when you're dealing with a, a chargeback, you are in turn dealing with the card brands who do have some very, very out of date systems. Um, so you want someone that sits in front of you that can kind of obscure that from you so that you're not directly interacting with this really obscure, you know, batch system. Um, as far as disputes goes, um, I guess um, there are other vendors that come into play with disputes. Some folks that have a lot of disputes, um, they'll use a vendor like a chargeback 911 or a chargeback defense where you can get an alert um, that, hey, the customer called up the issuing bank and they, they're questioning this transaction. Through some, some of the payment gateways, we can uh, give you an alert to say, hey, you might want to contact this customer. This might turn into a dispute. Um, with disputes, it's really important that um, you keep on top of it because there, it's a very complex system where you have 10 days to do um, this part of it. For example, if the customer calls up and just says, I don't recognize this charge, 
it's called a retrieval request, and you have a certain amount of time. And you know what's really irritating about it is each of the car brands gives you a different. You know, somebody says it's seven days, somebody says it's ten days. So if you don't have a single portal and a single place where you know maybe you have an alert like a to-do list that says you know respond, this customer wants a copy of the receipt. This customer says that you know the item was broken. If you have multiple accounts and you're getting disputes on all of these accounts, sometimes you might miss one. You know, maybe you miss it by a day, and darn it, the cardholder gets refunded the money simply because you didn't respond, but maybe you were in the right the whole time. Um, lastly, pricing options. So, um, with payment processing, there are um, fees. About, uh, roughly around 3% per transaction. And um, some clients, some merchants prefer to have all of their fees taken out at the end of the month. They want to have cash in their pocket during the month, and then they say, okay, true me up at the end of the month, and um, just take out my fees in one, one ACH debit to my account. Other clients say, I like to keep a little bit more on top of it, and I just want you to deposit me net my fees every day. And in different times of a business, you know, say you might have a month where it's tight, right? And you want to switch to say, I'm going to hold off my fees to the end of the month. You know, maybe you had a bump in the supply chain, and you just want to, you just want a little bit of extra money in your pocket. There are vendors out there that will fix you on one, and and you can't change. So it's nice to ask about, you know, do you have um, monthly and daily fee options? Um, in the event that you know you want to switch, you should be able to just ring them up and, and switch, right? Um, also, there are two um, pricing models that that you can have. One is called a cost plus model or interchange plus, and one is a bundled price. So this is something that um, when you go out and you see, you know. The processing is 2.9%. That's a bundled cost. Some payment vendors only offer bundled costs, and that's you get what you get. Sometimes that's great because you can anticipate how much your payment processing is going to cost you, right? You just know 3% off the top of every transaction. But there's also an option that some vendors offer that's called um, Interchange Plus. So what they do is they get the true rate from Visa and MasterCard, and they mark it up and pass it on to you. So I, I think it's MasterCard, like it's a statement, you know, there's, you get a line item for every type of interchange qualification rate. So you might have, for example, you know, it's a fuel card, debit, you know, fuel transaction on a debit card, and then say the next person pays with a, um, you know, vacation rewards mile. That vacation rewards transaction is gonna be a lot more expensive than a, a debit card. The debit cards are all regulated, I, I don't know, maybe eight years ago there was a Durban amendment where they said, you know, we're gonna, debit cards are capped at a certain price. It's actually a, a fixed price for the debit card transaction versus the credit card transaction, you know, it would vary. So if you are selling, um, you know, just in a B2C world, somebody's gonna show up with a debit card, somebody's gonna show up with, you know, an American Express, you're probably going to average out to about 3%, roughly. Some transactions actually cost 4%. So um, you're probably OK. But if you know, you're selling to, say, like a lot of students, a lot of students now just pay with the debit card. right? And so those transactions are actually a lot cheaper for you to process cost-wise on the Visa side than it is uh, for a credit card. So if you're heavily weighted on, say, uh, Business cards, you know, you're selling a lot of B2B transactions. Those might qualify at Visa for 1.7%. However, if you're doing a bundle of pricing, you're paying 3% for it, and so you didn't really have to. So it's nice to have an option to do cost plus if you want to, so you can tailor it to, you know, who your customer is. You also want to, you know, look at your statement and say, you know, I'm getting a lot of debit cards, or I'm getting a lot of really, you know, maybe you are getting a lot of Amex black cards or, you know, 4% charge, and it's actually a really good deal for you to um, go with the 3% rate. Your slide is not showing it. Yeah, I think that was my last one. Oh, so okay. I, yeah, I, I borrowed the computer, and it <laughs> keeps locking me out. So um, that said, does anybody have any questions about payment? Yes. I 
hope I know the answer. I hope I know the answer. Yeah, maybe not, because I don't know if anybody knows the answer to my problem. I have two new clients. One is taking payments by phone and fax. Okay. And the other one is using a contact form on his website and taking credit card numbers. Okay. So I told both of these people, and I may be wrong, that I think it's illegal for them to have those credit card numbers. And the, the email's got to be insecure. It's not illegal. Um, you can do, oh, yeah. It's not illegal. Um, it, the PCI standard doesn't say that you can't do it. They say if you do it, you must do something to secure Right, so it's not secure to get somebody's credit card number in an email, right? No, you should you should definitely not do that. <laughs> but um, if you know if they're taking the if they're getting it over the email over the phone is fine. You know you can get it over the phone. You can enter it. What they what they are probably entering it into is called a virtual terminal. Right. Um, so you, and that's perfectly store. fine. But yeah, you wouldn't want to. Um, you know, for example, um, if, if you said I'm getting um, credit card over email, then you would have to prove that you're encrypting it. And, you know, do some things like there are, um, you know, it's just a good idea to take the card number, run it through, don't write it down anywhere, because then if you write it down, then you have to prove you have physical, physical security, and it's just like a better idea to like not do that at all. But what I would, yeah, yeah what I would suggest to your client that's doing um, the, the telephone order or the, the mail order, maybe they can look into like an, in, an online invoicing system. You know, maybe they can send, they can send them an invoice and they can click to pay and then the, card holder can enter their card number in and you can do it all kind of in real time with someone on the phone you know if they have email and that way um, everything is tokenized um, the card holder is entering their card on an invoice payment system that's posted elsewhere and you can just say you know I never I never saw the card number. and you had a second scenario the, the, the email was the second one okay it's a, it's a fishing boat charter uh -huh. He's using a regular contact form, uh, uh, Ninja Forms. Okay. And he's got he's built a field for the person to add the, the credit card number into it. And he says, "Oh no, it's okay because I've got a security certificate." I'm going to tell. I was thinking it was more complex than that, but then I realized the only real problem is that he's getting email a credit card. Yeah, so that, you probably want to avoid that just because there's a lot of extra things that you'll need.